to get started this evening. Uh, good to see everyone out. Uh, glad to have our visitors with us. Uh, we're, con- we're finishing up, we're wrapping up our, our quarter uh, study on the book of Genesis. We're going to be in uh, Genesis 48, if you want to turn there. Uh, that's where we'll begin. And uh, if you don't have the material for uh, the class tonight, there's some in the back. And then um, next Wednesday's material will be back there when, when you leave. So uh, it's just not out there right now. So we'll have it out there here shortly. Um, before we get uh, started in our study, let's go to God in prayer. Dear Holy and Righteous Father in Heaven, we thank you, Lord, for this day, the time that we've been able to live and breathe and move around. We, we thank you, Lord, for the blessings of this life, the material things that we have, and most importantly, the spiritual things. Pray, Lord, that as we study together this evening, that we would grow in our understanding of your truth and help us to see your great power, your great wisdom, and help us to have the proper reverence and respect. We are in all of the great plan that you have for mankind as we see it unfolding here in this study with Genesis. And we just pray, Lord, that you'll help us to grow in our appreciation and in our faith, in your promises, and help us to to look to the things that you've done in the past and and let that be a strength to us. We pray, Lord, that you look down upon us and tender mercy, forgive us of our sins. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I want to start this class, uh, this last class, with the last question first in our material. So when we think about uh, things that we've learned in the book of Genesis, in our study, what thing stands out to you? I wrote down a few things, but I'd really like to hear what, what stands out to you in our study in Genesis? You see the plan unfolding as you go through Genesis. I mean, we start there in Genesis 3.15, you know, right after the fall of man and that, that uh, messianic uh, promise uh, there. And then we see, see it unfolding as, you know, God made these, these promises, these three promises to Abraham. And we see that thread continuing throughout the book of Genesis. And then if we just fast forward and go into Matthew and, and look at the prophets, we even see that plan unfolding over time, right? We sing that song in his time. I mean, that's something that that I've learned. And and this is, you know, uh, God doesn't count time like we do. So what else? Yeah. I would say that uh, Jacob and his family, uh, he uh, takes us right into the last of Genesis. There's a lot going on. We may not understand. And uh, I think in, in Luke 24 and 44, Jesus says, Then he said to his disciples, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he next verse, he says, that It is written. Christ is suffered, and one third day rise from the dead. Yep, that's, that's quite a bit. Yeah, and and we're just studying the very beginning of this, right? What else? What else did do you learn from the Book of Genesis so far? What does Genesis mean? Beginnings. What did we learn started in Genesis? What are some of those things? What's that? His plan for salvation. Okay, his plan. We learn about uh, the first man and woman, right? We learn about the first home, the first marriage. What else do we learn uh, first? First sin. Sin, okay. First sin. What else? 
Abraham, God chasing Abraham. <laughs> and we read about the first sacrifice, right? And what else? We read other things about, you know, tools that were created and instruments that were created. We, this is the first time that we read about these kind of things. We read about government for the first time. Nations. Um, and how about rain? I mean, there are just so many things we could just pick. But, uh, you know, surely we see a lot of uh, beginning of... Uh, mankind, the beginning of creation, all these things started in the book of Genesis. What else? What else do we learn from the book of Genesis? Yeah, Arthur. <clears throat> no, I agree that when it says that Adam named all the animals, and yeah. yet if you see on TV, it couldn't talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Only in Disney movies. Yeah, yeah. Um, what else do we learn? Noah. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, we learn about the first flood, right? Um, and, you know, I think, you know, something else that really jumped up in, uh, to me as, as we're studying this is we fast forward over to Hebrews chapter 11, that famous chapter that we sometimes call the Hall of Fame of Faith. And whose names do we read in there as examples of faith? Abraham. Jacob, Isaac, these are people that we've been studying. This is, you know, and you look at the book of uh, Romans and it talks about the faith of Abraham and that it was accounted to him for righteousness. And it, it goes on to say, uh, talking about Abraham, that he was the father of our faith. So we really see faith, uh, you know, in, in the book of uh, Genesis and it continues to play out, uh, you know, throughout time. Uh, even today. So anything else on that? I just wanted to get us to thinking about some of the things that we've learned as we've studied the book of Genesis. Anything else? First murder. First murder. Okay. See, if you could just keep thinking about it, you're, you're going to come up with a whole long list. Okay. Let's, uh, let's go into Genesis uh, chapter 48. We want to read the first seven verses here and uh, try to pick this apart a little bit. It says, After this, Joseph was told... Behold, your father is ill. So he took him and his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And it was told to Jacob, your son Joseph has, has come to you. Then Israel summoned his strength and sat up in bed. And Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Lutz in the land of Canaan and blessed me and said, said to me, Behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you, and I will make you a company of people and will give you this land to your offspring after you for an everlasting possession. And now your two sons who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt are mine. Ephraim and Manasseh shall be mine, as Reuben and Simeon are. And the children that you fathered after them shall be yours. They shall be called by, your, by the name of their brothers in, the, in their inheritance. As for me, when I came to Padan, uh, to, to my sorrow, Rachel died in the land of Canaan. On the way there uh, was, was some, still some distance to go to Ephra. And I buried her there on the way to Ephra, that is Bethlehem. So a couple things that we want to uh, try to talk about here. When, when, when Jacob uh, is, is talking about um, this, this conversation that God had with him, we see this reinforcement of this promise. We see him talking about the land promise and the nation promise here. And um, again, just you know, uh, continuing to see that thread um, uh, throughout the book of uh, Genesis. And so when we think about what he said to his sons, he said to Ephraim and Manasseh, they shall be mine as Reuben and Simeon are. What was Jacob trying to get at here? What was the purpose of making, making this point? What do you think? <laughs> Who was going to inherit the land of Canaan? The, 
these 12 sons, these, these, you know, the descendants of these 12 sons. And uh, we, we find out later uh, in the next chapter that um, two of those sons, they didn't get any land at all because of the way they acted. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. But we find out that Ephraim and Manasseh were a part of that inheritance. Jacob was just making a point that they are my sons and they're going to be a part of this blessing that God has given uh, to us. And they're going to be a part of uh, the, the people that possess this land. And so I think that was the key point. And, you know, these two children of uh, Joseph were going to uh, be a part of that just as his other sons are. Any other thoughts on that? Does that make sense? Well, since Reuben was not going to receive any inheritance, I, I assume this all, and being in the family having 12 sons, they probably wouldn't do that every day. Uh, it was truly a dysfunctional family. We talked about that already. Um, and, and we'll point some of that out as, as we go along. I find it interesting, if you look at verse 7, it talks about Rachel being buried where? What city? Why is that important? Okay. So, we just want to fast forward for just a brief second, because, I mean, this is, uh, begins to help us understand God's big plan, starting all the way into the book of Genesis. Going to Matthew uh, chapter 2 and uh, verse 18, 17 and 18, you remember when Herod made a decree to kill all the, the male uh, children, okay, male babies, and that was in the Bethlehem area. Notice in uh, chapter 2 verse 17 it says, then was the prophet, then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation, Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. See the connection? We, we, we see this just glimpse, just a brief reference to Rachel being buried in Bethlehem. And lo and behold, that was a part of God's big plan. And we see that playing out even in, in uh, the book of Matthew there. Um, so so we, we, we certainly see that uh, um, you know, Jacob is giving assurance that, that Joseph's sons are, are going to be a part of this inheritance. And we see that Joseph or uh, Jacob ends up blessing these sons. And notice in verse 15, and notice what Joseph says. Uh, uh, he blessed Joseph and said, notice what Jacob said, the God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God who has been my shepherd all my life long to this day, the angel who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the boys, and in them let my name be carried on, and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and let them go into a multitude into the midst of the earth. So when we hear this, um, this, this prophecy. What do we learn about th this in terms of Joseph or uh, Jacob? What do we learn about Jacob? What does he know? So we, we see here that he acknowledges God is the one that was his shepherd. I mean, if you think about all the things that happened to Jacob in his life, you know, um, you know, being told a lie that his son Joseph is dead, and and you know the the testing that went on with with Egypt, and you know having to send Benjamin, and um, you know the the fact that he had to deal with uh, you know uh, his family uh, troubles with uh, two of his sons killing other people, and and then you know. Uh, one of them having uh, an incestuous relationship with one of Jacob's wives. I mean, you start thinking about this. Th these are all the things that he had to deal with. And how was he able to get through it? He acknowledges that God was his shepherd. And, 
in that um, he's the same one that Abraham and Isaac walked with and he's acknowledging that he's part of that. Yeah, but I'm just going to say it took him a long time to realize that and his old age he finally realized that he'd been shepherded all that time. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, it's, you know, if we sit back and reflect, I mean, there's a lot of reflection as we approach our last days, right? There's a lot of thinking about that. And, um, you know, I, I'm not a real big Facebook user, but there's this thing that they call timeline. And, you know, all these events in your life, you can, you can plop on this timeline. I don't do that, by the way. Uh, and, but you can lay out a timeline of events that have happened in your life. And, and I get the idea that Jacob is kind of doing that. He's looking back at all the things that have happened and see that he was able to get through and now he can see God's plan more clearly. And so, it, to Phil's point, it took him a little bit of time to kind of get there, but now he can see it. What else do we learn uh, from this? Why is it important with his reference to carry on the name? We have that today, right? We want our children to carry on our name and then their children and, you know, and, and hopefully that, that continues. Um, but why did he want this name continued? I mean, what, what was the nation? They were going to become a nation and what were they going to be called? What was Jacob called? Israel. Okay, so, so we, again, we see this and, and, he, and he connects that with this whole idea of them growing into a multitude in the midst of the earth, um, you know, based upon God's promise and the things that he's done in his life, he, he can see clearly that that's exactly what's going to happen. He's not going to see it, but he knows it's going to happen. That's why he's in the Hall of Fame of Faith in Hebrews 11. So anything else on that? Other thoughts? Okay, so, so we find out that... Uh, uh, Jacob blesses uh, Ephraim and, and Manasseh. And then in uh, verse 21, it says, Then Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I am about to die, but God will be with you and will bring you again to the land of your fathers. Moreover, I have given you, to you rather than to your brothers one mountain slope that I took from the ham, hand of the Amorites with the sword and with my bow. So um, again, uh, we, we see him imparting gifts. He's, he's starting to uh, bless his children because he knows he doesn't have long. And uh, he knows he's about to die. It's interesting. He says, you know, uh, talking about Joseph being brought again into the land of his fathers. And we'll see in our last chapter here that Joseph makes a request of his brothers to do what? Carry his bones to the land of his father. So, so that's how this was, was supposed to play out. And um, we certainly uh, uh, see God's great wisdom and, and might in this whole, whole chapter. Okay, so anything else on chapter 48? We want to move into chapter 49. Uh, there's a number of things here with regard to the blessings of his most of them were blessings. Some of them weren't. But they were really predictions about what was going to happen with the descendants of his children. And um, so it's, uh, it says here in, in verse 49, Then Jacob called his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you what shall happen to you in the days to come. He's making a prediction of what's going to happen. Assemble and listen, O, son, o sons of Jacob. Listen to Israel, your father. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, and the first fruits of my strength, preeminence and dignity, and preeminent in power. Unstable as water, you shall not have preeminence, because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it. He went up uh, to my couch. So, you know, if we if we go back to um, Genesis chapter 35 and verse 22. How many wives did Jacob have? Four. Rachel, Leah, 
Bill, uh, the handmaid, <laughs> right? And who was the other one? Zilpah. Uh, so, so he had four. And so what we find in Genesis chapter 35 and verse 22 is um, that Reuben ended up having relationship with Bilhah, one of Jacob's wives. Did Jacob forget it? <laughs> no. He remembered it. And there's probably other things that happened, but what does he refer to Reuben as? Unstable. Unstable as water. And I'm sure, you know, water, a creek, or a river has a way of taking the path of least resistance, right? No matter what people do. They build levees, they can build all these things, but what happens a lot of times with a Mississippi River or any of these? Just go over their banks or they, they spill out. Uh, so so he, he is referred to as being unstable as water. And then he says uh, in verse 5, Simeon and Levi are brothers. Weapons of violence are their swords. Let my soul come not into their counsel. O my glory, or my glo glory be not joined to their company. For in their anger they killed men, and in their willfulness they hamstrung oxen. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. So, again, you know, we can go, go back to uh, Genesis chapter 34, and we read about, um, uh, you know, Di uh, Di Dinah. Diana, I think that was her name. Um, this was one of the daughters of Jacob. And she was defiled by Hamor. Uh, and so uh, Simeon and Levi uh, were angry about it and ended up going and killing Hamor, his son. And then they just ended up killing everyone in the city. They wiped them out. And so um, did Jacob forget that? <laughs> No, he remembered because they made it very difficult for Jacob to live in Canaan. What if all the Canaanites, you know, decided, hey, you see what they did? Let's just all pool our resources and go and wipe them out. And that was what Jacob was concerned about because they couldn't control their anger. And, and we find out later in the book of Deuteronomy and, and Numbers that uh, these two did not get land. They did not end up with any land. As a matter of fact, the Levites didn't get land. They, they, that was the Levitical priesthood, right? They were just scattered uh, throughout the land. So uh, they didn't have a land uh, to themselves. And notice uh, what he says to Judah here. He says, Judah, your brother shall praise you. you shall uh, your, your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons shall bow down before you. Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down and he, he crouched as a lion and as a lioness who dares to roust him. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ru ruler's staff from between his feet until tribute comes to him. And to him shall be the obedience of the people, binding his foal to the vine and his donkey's colt to the uh, choice vine. He has washed his garments in, in wine and his vesture in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth are whiter than milk. A lot of imagery here and language to kind of get us to thinking about what's going on here. But what do we learn about the, the blessing of J, uh, Judah? What stands out? A triumph. Did Christ come from? Yes. And, and, and we see some references here um, uh, that, that help us to understand that there's a bigger picture here, right? Um, and so he refers to Judah as a lion's cub. Okay, so what happens to cubs? They grow up and they become lions, right? And he's referring to him as a lion's cub. At some point, the real lion's going to mature, right? Again, you know, some, some thoughts or ideas pointing towards uh, something greater. 
probably the most uh, important thing that stands out is in verse 10 it says, the scepter shall not depart from, from Judah. What do you think that points to? Remember the lineage of Christ came through Judah. What do you think that points to? That reference? Yeah. I mean, Jesus, Jesus ends up being the King of kings, the Lord of lords. The scepter will not depart from there. And if we just uh, uh, pause for just a, a moment and yeah, again flip back over to Matthew chapter 1. Notice what it says in the first three verses here. It, it then goes to describe the genealogy of Jesus. And it says, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob. Jacob the father of Judah, his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez. And then it goes on and on. So the lineage, the very lineage of Jesus Christ came through Judah. And we know that Jesus was, was to be that King of kings and that Lord of lords. And so the scepter has never departed from Judah in that sense. And so, again, we see these glimpses and uh, pointing to something that happens in the future. Anything else stand out uh, to you with what uh, Jacob said to Judah? Scepter here being uh, ruled in the sense that the lineage came down through and David on that and Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the scepter is uh, signifies you know ruler, king, you know somebody uh, in charge. Um, notice uh, one thing that has stood out to me too was. Uh, notice how Jacob mentions that in, in verse 8, your father's son shall bow down before you. In, in what way do we see that playing out? What do you think? David became the greatest ever to be bowed down. I mean, when Christ came, everybody, every knee bows, right? And so, so I think, again, we just see these little glimpses of things that are pointing to something much greater uh, going on in the future. So, um, anything else on, on Judah there? Okay. Uh, I'm not going to read all the other ones. You can read through that. But if you uh, jump down to verse 22, it says, Joseph is a fruitful uh, uh, bow. A fruitful bow by a spring... His branches run over the wall. The archers bitterly attacked him and shot him and harassed him severely. Yet his bow remained unmoved. His arms were made agile by the hands of the mighty one of Jacob. From there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel, by the God of your father who, who will help you, by the Almighty who will bless you with the blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that crouches beneath, blessings of the the breast and of the womb. The blessings of your father are mighty beyond the blessings of my parents. Up to the bounties of, ever, of the everlasting hills. May they be on the head of Joseph and on the brow of him who was set apart from his brothers. What do we, what do we learn here? What jumps out at you as Jacob's talking about these blessings for Joseph? What stands out? Seems like the blessing here, he the receive those that's shown to Abraham, right? So he, he is the sparkle of Abraham's descendant all the way down through. Yeah, of course. And um, I, I think it's interesting when he starts talking about uh, the archers bitterly attacked him, his, he, his bow remained un, unmoved. What do you think all that's talking about with regard to Joseph? I mean, if we look back at Joseph's life, where he started in his father's house, he was his favorite son. Then he ended up getting thrown in a pit, sold off into Egyptian slavery. And then we know how that story unfolds. 
But at every turn, he was on this roller coaster ride. Well, um, Jacob likes it to, you know, people that were shooting, um, shooting at him, arrows. And yet he remained unmoved. It says a lot about Joseph and, and the faith that he had in God. And he talks about, from there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. What do you think Jacob's talking about there? The shepherd, the stone of Israel. He's being prepared to Jesus. Yeah, yeah. And, and we kind of touched on that in one of our lessons. Joseph, in, in, even though he's not described that way in the, in the New Testament or other places, but there's a lot of similarities between Joseph as a type of Christ. And, and there's just lots of examples we could go through. But um, w did he save his people? He, he was instrumental in saving. God set him up to be able to preserve Israel uh, through this famine and to help them with this promise that God made to, to make of them a great nation. Um, so anything else uh, in here that you want to point out or bring up? I just want to kind of highlight a few things there. All right, so if, if we jump into uh, chapter 50, um, I find it interesting in, in the first few verses there. It says, then, then Joseph fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. So the physicians embalmed Israel. Forty days were required for it. For that is how many are required for embalming. And the Egyptians wept for him seventy days. What does that tell you about, I mean, the culture. I mean, can you imagine weeping over a lost one for 70 days? Most of the time people say, you know, three days, right? Well, this weeping was going on for 70 days. Notice who was weeping. The Egyptians. What does that tell you about the impact or the influence Jacob had on the Egyptians? To the point where, you know, he prospered. God blessed him. They saw that, and he he was a uh, you know helping them to prosper as well, and and so he was a very significant uh, person uh, in in the uh, Egyptian culture there. So, um, and so we find out um, the next few verses that uh, you know once this was over with, um, Joseph makes a request of Pharaoh to, to leave Egypt and go and bury his father uh, in Canaan, um, in the, the place where Abraham and Isaac and, and their family are buried. And, and it talks about that. So, uh, but let's, let's jump down to verse 15. So after Jacob had died, after he was buried, notice what it says here. It says, when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did, they did evil to you. And now please forgive their transgression, the transgressions of their servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for I am in the place of God. As, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. So, um, so what was the major concern of his brothers after Jacob died? That he was going to see that they were punished for some of the things that he they had done to him. And is there anything that Joseph has done up to this point to give his brothers any indication that he had thoughts of revenge? None. So, what does that tell you about the, his brothers? I mean, if you 
Think about these blessings and some of these curses that, in, in a lot of ways that uh, Jacob pronounced on his, on his sons. Um, you know, they were mischievous. And, uh, and, and I would argue, you know, did, did Jacob really tell them to tell Joseph to forgive? You notice how convenient that is? We don't read anything up to that point. And, you know, we don't know for sure Jacob could have told, could have said that, but it, it's highly suspicious. And, and so um, I think it was just a part of their plan to try to, you know, cover their bases, so to speak. Yeah. I just think uh, having 12 sons and 11 of them being against you, <coughs> and they're all out for their own. And it really comes out as the one that God has chosen. And that's just the way the world is today. Sin, sin, sin. But, but I find it interesting when we think about sin, we think about, you know, situations like this where they feel vulnerable uh, that Joseph is going to exact revenge. And then, you know, under this pressure of not knowing and needing to do something, they make this quick decision. Oh, I got a plan. I'll do this. And that gets people in a lot of trouble sometimes. And you get under pressure and, and you know, you want to resolve a situation. Sometimes we don't always make the right decision. I know I don't, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's a challenge. But, but we definitely see that, that uh, they, they made, the, uh, you know, made this story up. Um, and, you know, they were motivated because they, they were fearful and of their own lives and what would happen to them. Um, so what can we learn from Joseph's response, though? I mean, think about all the things that his brothers have done. And he was willing to forgive them. I think he already forgave them. He, he, he said that, right? And, and so, why would they feel like he didn't really mean it? You know? But he gives them reassurance. Do not fear... And, um, and, and so we, we, we certainly see uh, him comforting them. We see Joseph being that, that good example of rendering good for evil. I mean, his brothers, you know, were evil in what they did to him. I mean, you know, all the difficulty that he went through. I mean, he could have stewed in prison. He could have, you know, schemed and plotted and planned, uh, you know, what he wanted to do with them when he saw them, but that was not his purpose because he knew what God want, wanted to have done there and why he was there. Notice in, in verse uh, 20 there, it says, As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it good to bring about that people, many people should be kept alive as they are today. What does that say about the providence of God? It works. It works. <laughs> you know, God is the only one that I know of that can take things that, you know, people have done against us uh, that's been evil and turn it into something good. If we try to do that, we're going to goof it all up, right? And so sometimes we just have to trust in God. Things are not always the way they appear, but God has a plan for me and he's got one for each and every one of us. If we'll trust him. And so we just have to do our part and trust that God is going to direct our lives in the, in the way that it should go. But no clearer picture of the providence of God than we can see in the life of Joseph and how things ended up. It didn't look that way when Joseph was in prison, did it? Didn't look that way when he was a slave. But now he's, you know, second in charge of... of really all of Egypt and responsible for distributing food for the world. I mean, he, he moved from one place to an exalted place. Yeah, go ahead, Matt. Um, 
I think, you know, that verse, especially reading that verse, and just seeing how this is kind of a microcosm of kind of what happens throughout the Bible in so many different situations and stories, just the providence of God just kind of overwhelmingly succeeding. Uh, you know, especially in Joseph's life and Jacob's life. I mean, just from where he once was to where he is and how this entire family and Israel's future comes out of Egypt. Um, and the fact that all those people were kept alive and lived when in any other situation they would have died. Just like, you know, when Paul was being uh, questioned by the Jews um, and, and I forget who it was who said, but, you know, let's just let this play play out. And if, you know, if, if Paul lives and he's going to continue speaking about God, then this is God's will. This is God's problem. It's just kind of an example of what happens time and time again. Really. Yeah. No, that's a good point. I mean, you think about Paul, the persecutor of the church, and I guarantee you he wasn't thinking that his life was going to land where it did. God had a plan for Paul. And, and so, you know, Paul was able to fit into that plan. Somebody that did evil and, uh, you know, uh, fought against Christ and, and God and his church and um, to turn him into the staunchest supporter and promoter of, of Christ and the church. Again, we see God being able to take something that was evil and turn it into something good in the person of Paul, right? And we see that in our lives today, too. If we look back at things that we did before we became a Christian, um, you know, there's shame and remorse and all kinds of things for, for things that we've done. But God was able to take those evil things that we did and turn them into good and only god can do that did you have a yeah interesting thing he lived 110 years but he wanted his bones taken to Canaan. and Canaan is where the children of the left go from Egypt when they go to the promised land right right and so um again you know, what message was Joseph sending when he had his brothers um, commit to making that promise happen? We're not going to be here. We're going to be leaving. Okay. And how many years were they in Egyptian bondage? 430. Okay. So, um, so that promise was passed. It could have been forgotten, right? Multiple generations, 430 years, a lot of things could be forgotten, but not that one. And you still had Joseph's embalmed body sitting there. Well, I tell you, those Egyptians must be really good at embalming. So, so you know, certainly um, we see that, you know, him leaving this life, he's leaving a message to the descendants of Israel that we're going to be leaving this place. And when we do, I want you to take my bones and go and bury them. Okay. Um, any other thoughts on that, um, on the last words of Joseph? Well, I'd like to thank you for the interesting story of uh, able to study Genesis as we have done for the last six months. I love the book of Genesis. It's, there's so much there. And... We kind of went through it pretty quick, actually. But um, any other comments? Any other lessons learned or things to share? Yep, go ahead. Um, from Sunday morning, the sermon. Uh, Joseph wasn't going to be wrapped up in one part of his life. Revenge. He saw the big picture. Yeah. Yeah. And and we we learn about that. Um, he was aware of that big picture. Maybe not at, at first when everything started happening to him, but somehow between prison and the interpretation of dreams he learned the big picture of what god had planned and he was behind it 100 percent yeah yeah the other thing is moses wrote this several hundred years later he had to ask him yeah. of course it is inspired right inspired writing 
Anything else before we... I appreciate everyone's participation in the class, and uh, hopefully you got something out of it. And um, the material for next Wednesday's class should be in the back there. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. How is it that his, that he becomes two tribes? How is it that he becomes he's from Manasseh rather than Joseph? The, so I actually don't know because Jacob, uh, you know, we didn't read that part, but when he blessed him, he had his right hand on the youngest son and his left hand. And Joseph tried to say, no, you got it wrong. You need to put the right hand. And he said, no, I know what I'm doing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's what happened. Yeah. Did, did you? I don't know. I was, I was wondering whether it was to repay it for the evil done to him or repay it for the salvation that he gave, that Joseph gets a double portion. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. Wonderfully blessed. Okay. Did that help? I don't know. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you.